As they are leaving, just a quick note about, um, about the scripture that we're about to hear. As many of you know who've been here for the last several Sundays, we are taking a different journey through Lent than usual. Oftentimes the journey of Lent focuses just on the character of Jesus, rightfully so, and also on our responsibility towards other human beings and our particular relationship with God. But this Lent, we're reading those appointed scriptures from the Gospel of Luke in a different way. We're reading them not only with the Bible in one hand, but also holding all creation in the other, the other book. Because down through the ages, theologians have understood that God speaks to us both through the written word of the written text of the Bible and also through the book of creation. And when you read the Bible with that particular perspective, when your ears are opened in that particular way, all kinds of new things can come out of texts and stories that we think we know as well as we know our own names. Today's parable is one such text. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's the appointed lesson being read here today in St. Francis Cathedral and up the road at Christ Lutheran and a number of other places all around the world. And it's one perhaps that you've heard more than once. It's called sometimes the parable of the lost sheep. It's about, uh, it is a parable that Jesus tells when some people come to him and chastise him because of the company he keeps. And then Jesus, rather than getting angry, simply tells not one, not two, but three parables all about joy in finding that which is lost. Let our hearts and our lives be open to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this ancient text. And may you hear it both through the words of the Bible and also know it through the book of creation. Now all the tax, co tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the religious leaders and the scholars and lawyers were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Word of God, word of life. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. We pray for your wilderness, O Lord. We pray for this whole earth. And we pray that an ancient story and a new song might go deep into our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Open our lives, O Lord, to receive those gifts of your wisdom through story and song. Open our lives to receive the gift of your spirit so that those ancient words and new song might somehow become new life for us that we might then go forth from this place committed to care for that life through this whole world. Help us, Lord, to love this world as you so love. We pray in your name. Amen. As a very young child, my image of the Good Shepherd that came from this story from the parables and Luke's Gospel was the image of the Good Shepherd as portrayed in the big round stained glass windows that hung up, stained glass window that hung above the altar at Tempe First Congregational Church in Tempe, Arizona. That Good Shepherd was fair of skin and eye. He had probably, he was probably in his mid 30s, strong, had flowing blonde brown curls. He was dressed in a robe. He was dressed in a white robe that 
belied the fact that as a good shepherd, you're supposed to be running across arroyos and up mountains to find the sheep that are lost. He was the cleanest shepherd I'd ever seen. But nonetheless, he held a lamb cradled in his arms, and all around him were the other sheep. And that was the image of the good shepherd that I had. But then when I was eight years old, my mother gave me a wonderful book called Little Herder in Winter and Spring. It was a book that was in both English and Navajo, unusual at that time. And it told the story of a little herder, a little Navajo girl, about four or five years old, who was not dressed and didn't look anything like the Good Shepherd of Tempe First Congregational Church. She what, didn't wear a long flowing robe. She looked very similar to the picture you see on the front cover of your bulletin. She had a velvet blouse and a skirt, long skirt. Her black hair was pulled back tight from her face. But she was equally a good shepherd as she cradled that lamb in her arms. And like any good shepherd, she cared and loved those sheep of her family. And it was hard work, she said in that story. She said, when you walk with sheep, you have to take a lot of steps. You have to go down into arroyos and up on mesas because you never know where sheep are going to go. You have to find them green pastures and something to eat. You have to find them water. And when they get lost, you have to go find them. And so one day, little herder had to do just that. All the sheep had come back to her family's compound, except for one ewe that was lost. And so she set out to go find that one mama sheep. And when she finally found that sheep, she found that that sheep had already had a lamb. And as it was getting along toward dark, and it was cold, and even though she was hungry and more than a bit afraid, she picked up that lamb in her arms and she walked as quickly as she could because that little lamb couldn't walk so fast. And there was a coyote howling off in the distance. And when little herder got home, her parents rejoiced. They rejoiced that, her daughter, that their daughter was home and they rejoiced that that one stray sheep and that little lamb had made it home safely too. And the picture of that little girl is that of a child holding a lamb almost as big as she is. And that lamb is serene and calm and love. And that child holds that lamb as if it were her own flesh and blood. Because it is. Because the same hand that created that little girl and her family and you and me is the hand that created that mama sheep and that baby lamb created all the creatures, great and small. Ovine, bovine, apian, <laughs> Iberian, sheep, cattle, birds, bees, everything. Jesus told the story of the Good Shepherd because he wanted to make sure that the people who were listening to him knew that they were connected to all those other people that they considered outcasts, sinners and tax collectors. He wanted to make sure that they knew that those people were also created by a loving God, the same loving God who had created them. It's why he told not one but three stories a story, yes, about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and even though he had 99 back in the fold, all safe and sound, he would risk everything to go find the lost one. He told a story about a father who had two sons, and when that one son wandered off and spent his inheritance, why should the father worry? He had another son who had better sense. 
But when the uh, second son came home, that prodigal father rejoiced. Not because he loved one son more than the other, but because he loved them equally. And he held them equally as if they were his own flesh and blood. Because they were. Just like that little Navajo shepherd girl hold, holds that lamb as if it were her own. Because it is. It is. Read through the eyes of not only the Bible, but also through the eyes and ears that God has given us to understand and read the book of creation this traditional story of the lost sheep from Luke's gospel has much more expansive meaning in our time. Because you and I both know, both know, that unlike that good shepherd of Luke's gospel, unlike that little Navajo girl, We human beings these days have a tendency to think that not every sheep counts, nor every species. There are some that we, won't, we don't mind losing for the rest of, for, for all of time because they don't have an economic value like the lesser prairie chicken whose habitat is being invaded for oil and gas wells. Or because that particular species does have an economic value, like the great blue whales hunted to the point of extinction. And I could stand here and just go all over statistic after statistic after statistic of the sixth extinction that is facing us on this planet. Thousands, hundreds of species won't be around for our grandchildren our great-grandchildren. But you know that. You read the news. You listen to the radio. You stream. You know what we're doing. But for me, at least, the place to begin is not... is not with the disastrous news, the place to begin is with that little child holding that lamb as if it were her own flesh and blood. Because for me at least, the place to begin is not with statistics, but with a picture, a black and white picture of a young boy age nine or 10 holding a bird with a broken wing and cradling it in his arms. That young boy was my father. He grew up in San Diego, California. Lee Waite Arnold was his name. And growing up in San Diego at the time that he did in the 1920s and 1930s, before San Diego got completely developed, it meant that he grew up outdoors, running along the beach, climbing the mountains, hiking, camping, he was a boy, Cub Scout, Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, all the way through. And you can't hardly see a picture of him. I have a box of pictures that I found a number of years ago in some of my mother's things of my father as a young boy and young man. And there's hardly a picture of him except for his wedding picture where he's not cradling some creature. <laughs> a dog, a puppy, a cat, a bird, a snake one time. <laughs> He put himself through college working at San Diego Zoo, which had just opened a few years before every summer. During World War II, when he was stationed as a Lieutenant JG on a minesweeper up in the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska, he researched and wrote a paper on the minor ox, A-U-K-S. They're teeny little birds that are related to the puffins. He even got it published in 1943 from that minesweeper. Before the war, with his degree in, his master's degree in desert uh, biology, my mother's master's degree was in desert botany, my father had worked as a high school biology teacher. And during the summers, 
he worked for a couple summers at, with the Arizona Fish and Game Department, which meant that my mother and my father spent the first two years of their married life living in a canvas tent outside of Phoenix, Arizona in the mesquite thickets because he had been commissioned to do a research project on white-winged doves. At the time, white-winged doves, which had been in super abundance all throughout southern Arizona for generations, were on the verge of being extinct. The population was decimated, and nobody could figure out why. So my father was hired to figure it out. Actually, both my parents were hired to figure out. He's the one who got paid, and his name was on the, on the research. But they both did it together, living in that tent, counting white-winged doves, climbing into their nest, looking at birds, looking at eggs, all of that. And his research showed, their research showed, that the reason the white-winged doves were being decimated and on the verge of extinction was because the hunting season coincided with the nesting season. Not a good idea. And because of that scientific research, the laws of the state of Arizona were changed and the hunting season was moved. Fast forward a few years when he was a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. His research did not have the same fate, unfortunately. He was hired on after the war, after World War II, as a biologist of the Fish and Wildlife Department. They lived in Southern California, up in Denver, and then in Albuquerque, all before I was born. And my father, at the time, my, at the, time the golden and bald eagle populations of this country were also on the downslide, almost to the point of extinction. Now this was the mid to late 1940s, early 1950s, long before Rachel Carson got people's attention about DDT and what it did not only to insects and fish, but also to birds, like eagles, and long before lead shot was seen as an environmental hazard for eagles, for vultures, for any bird that, that eats carrion, condors. But nonetheless, bald and golden eagles, those symbols of the United States, were about ready to be extinct. Why? Well, there was a bounty on eagles at the time, and had been since the 1800s. In fact, in one year, 1956, something like 125,000 eagle talons were turned into the Department of Agriculture for two bucks apiece. Because the anecdotal stories being told around the West about eagles were that they carried off <coughs> large lambs and small children. And therefore, they were a threat. And therefore, they needed to have a bounty, just like coyotes or wolves or any other predator animal. The Fish and Wildlife Service hired my father to climb up into eagles' nests <laughs> and do research. Because good science is not based on anecdote. It's based on research. So throughout New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, that's what my dad did for a couple, three years. He climbed up into eagle's nests, took pictures, sorted out all the scat and the bones and everything else, took pictures, and his research showed proof positive that in all of the eagle's nests he's climbed into, nary a one had a kneecap of a small child. <laughs> there wasn't even a lamb shank anywhere. What it had were fish bones, snake bones, rodent bones, lizard bones, all kinds of things that eagles eat. But not small children and not big lambs. He finished the research in 1949, 1950, sometime in there. But it wasn't published until 10 years after his death. Because unlike before, but as happens way too often, Politics trumped science, and there was too much of a lobby against the eagles. People believed too much of the anecdotal stories that had no basis in scientific fact, and the laws never changed. Not until Stuart Udall was the Secretary of the Interior in the 1960s did the bounty on eagles get lifted in this country. 
And I still remember, I still remember the hot July day when my mother and I were cleaning the garage, a typical summer ritual in the Arnold family, cleaning the garage and the postman came up with a pile of mail and handed it to my mom. And she flipped through it and saw that there was an envelope, big envelope, from the interior department. She didn't know what it was, but she opened it. Put it back in and walked into the house. It was 10 years after he died, and it was only then being published. 15 years of research. It broke my mom's heart. It broke my mother's heart not only because of my father, but because of all those evils that had been lost, because the bounty was still in place. These stories, these stories are about what it takes to care for this world. Because what it takes, my friends, is to count every single sheep. Doesn't matter if you've already counted one or seven or the 99th. We count and we care for every single sheep and every single species. And we hold them in our hearts and against ourselves as though they are our own flesh and blood. The way the good shepherd does in the big round window at Tempe First Congregational <coughs> Church. The way that little Navajo girl does in the picture you have today. The way my father did with that bird with a broken wing. We count every species because they're all made by the same creator God that made you and me and all creation. And God loves the lambs and the little girls, the eagles and the elders. God loves the mama sheep and the baby sheep just as much as God loves you and me. The place to begin is holding this creation against ourselves as though it is all our own flesh and blood. Because it is. It is. May we love this world as God so loves it. Thanks be to God. <laughs>